Ted Nelson quit the Mare Island Naval Shipyard in early 1941. The United States still lived in the uneasy calm before the storm. Europe was already ablaze, and across the Atlantic, shipyards in Britain were working day and night to replace merchant vessels lost to German U-boats. But in America, isolationism lingered. The U.S. Navy had just 337 warships ready for combat, and the merchant marine fleet, lifeline of any future war, was aging and slow. The shipyards themselves were bound by methods little changed since World War I rivets, scaffolds, and muscle. Every plate of steel demanded teams of men and days of labor. It was a process more suited to the 1920s than to a modern industrial war. The Mounted U.S. Maritime Commission, created in 1936, had foreseen the crisis. Its mission, rebuild America's merchant fleet through an ambitious program of mass production. By 1940, under the emergency shipbuilding program, Contracts were being drawn for Liberty ships, simple, rugged cargo vessels designed to be built quickly and cheaply. But even the most efficient assembly lines were throttled by one problem, the speed of welding. Rivets cracked, weld seams warped, and mounting fittings required scaffolds and entire crews. Every minute lost in production meant supplies lost at sea. In that world of bottlenecks, Nelson's idea, a gun that could fuse metal studs in a split second, wasn't just clever, it was revolutionary. When war erupted after Sioux Pearl Harbor, the demand for speed became a national obsession. President Roosevelt's call to make America the decru arsenal of democracy. Transformed factories, foundries, and shipyards into battlefronts of their own. Henry Kaiser's yards in Richmond, California, turned into monuments of industrial momentum, operating 24 hours a day. Women poured into the workforce. Rosie the Riveter became a symbol of determination. In those frantic months, any device that saved even seconds was treated as a strategic weapon. Nelson's stud welding gun fit perfectly into this fever of invention. Using a small ceramic flux cap, it shielded the weld from oxygen and created a clean, fast bond between a metal stud and steel plate. No pre-drilling, no bolts, no scaffolds. A single welder could attach hundreds of fittings per hour, something that had once required a team. The process wasn't just faster, it was safer. By eliminating the need to climb high scaffolds or crawl under hulls, it reduced accidents and fatigue. In early 1942, the Navy, desperate to meet quotas, ordered Nelson's tool into full production. His company, Nelson Stud Welding Copicuun, expanded from a garage operation to a network of factories supplying yards across the continent. The transformation was astonishing. Liberty ships that had once taken eight months to complete now slid down the ways in just six weeks. Entire hulls were fitted with deck gear and piping in record time. The Robert E. Peary, launched in November 1942, stunned the world when it was built in four days, 15 hours, and 30 minutes. A publicity triumph that showcased what American engineering could achieve under pressure. But the true measure of Nelson's invention wasn't just in the numbers. It was in its ripple effect. Each hour saved in shipbuilding meant more convoys reaching Britain, more tanks and aircraft arriving at the front, more soldiers supplied and fed. As the Battle of the Atlantic raged and U-boats sank over a thousand merchant ships in 1942 alone, these gains were not trivial. They were decisive. Historian Paul Kennedy later wrote that the outcome of the Atlantic War turned not on the sea itself, but on the docks and the factories behind it. Nelson's tool was one of those quiet but vital engines of victory. By mid-1943, a stud welding had spread far beyond shipyards. The U.S. Army used it in tank armor repair and bridge construction. Aircraft manufacturers adapted it for fuselage mounts and control surfaces. Every weld gun carried the legacy of one man's defiance. In the grand theaters of war, Nelson never fired a weapon. Yet his invention became as crucial as any gun or torpedo. The government recognized his contribution with two Navy E awards for excellence in war production.
Photographs from the era show Nelson standing beside the same admirals who had once dismissed him, his face lined by years of work but lit by a quiet pride. Reporters called him the mad welder who tamed the flame. The welding journal hailed his gun as a new language of speed in metal. When the war ended in 1945, stud welding remained a cornerstone of American industry. The technology migrated into peacetime construction. Bridges, skyscrapers, and automobiles all bore Nelson's mark. The Golden Gate Bridges' later reinforcements, post-war aircraft carriers, even early NASA test stands, relied on principles born in that Mare Island garage. Nelson himself rarely sought fame. To him, the war had proven not his genius but the power of perseverance. You don't need permission to fix what's broken, he told a young engineer years later. You just need the courage to keep striking until the spark catches. Today, few remember his name, yet every skyscraper, every ship, every welded structure carries a trace of his defiance. In the vast narrative of World War II, of generals, admirals, and great battles, the story of Ted Nelson reminds us that history is not only written by those who fight it, but also by those who build the tools that make victory possible. His madman's gadget, once rejected by the Navy, became the silent heartbeat of America's wartime miracle, proof that sometimes the smallest spark can outshine the darkest war. The true measure of Nelson's innovation became clear not in laboratories, but in the deafening rhythm of wartime assembly lines. Across the United States, from Mare Island to Portland, men and women trained overnight to use his compact welding guns. In a Navy Bureau of Ships circular dated May 1943, instructions urged every major shipyard to adopt stud welding, where applicable to reduce manpower and improve hull. Integrity. The report cited that the process could install 1-200 studs per hour with a single operator, compared to 120 by hand riveting. Historians such as David K. Allen in Steel and Strategy, the Industrial Front of World War II, emphasize that Nelson's technique embodied a new philosophy of war production, mechanized precision replacing craft tradition. The United States faced a staggering logistical demand, two oceans, multiple theaters, and a need for ships faster than ever conceived. The Liberty Ship and its successor, the Victory Ship, were not just vessels but symbols of an industrial miracle. Their speed depended on assembly line welding, and Nelson's studs held that system together, literally and figuratively. Stud welding also transformed submarine fabrication. Two, the confined interiors of Gato A and E. Balao class submarines required thousands of brackets for pipes, cables, and bunks. Traditional methods demanded access from both sides of the plate, impossible in narrow hulls. Nelson's gun made it possible to attach fittings internally without breaching pressure hulls, a breakthrough cited in Navy Department technical bulletins as saving extensive refitting time. By 1945, over 203 submarines incorporated his process. Economically, Nelson's contribution paralleled that of the automobile pioneers who turned Detroit into the arsenal of democracy. His guns reduced not only man hours but also tool inventory, training time, and material waste. Wartime audits by the U.S. Office of Production Management estimated total savings equivalent to 65 million. A colossal figure in 1940s currency. As naval historian Samuel Elliott Morrison later summarized, rephrased from History of United States Naval Operations in World War II, the speed with which American shipyards met the call was due less to manpower than to the genius of those who simplified the work. When the war ended, Nelson's once-rejected device had welded together the very ships that liberated continents. He received a Ho Second Navy E citation, and saw his company become a permanent fixture of American industry. Post-war reconstruction projects, from bridges to oil rigs, adopted the same principle he had pioneered in that modest garage in 1941. 
The method remains standard today in structural steel fabrication, highway construction, and even aerospace, a silent legacy of one man's wartime obsession. Yet, perhaps the most human measure of his impact lies in the stories of those who used his invention. Former shipyard workers interviewed in the 1950s by the U.S. Department of Labor remembered how the new guns reduced fatigue and injury. We could finish a section before lunch instead of the end of the week, one recalled. Another joked, Ted Nelson's gun was the best foreman we ever had. In retrospect, Nelson's story fits into a larger pattern of wartime innovation born from individual defiance. Like Andrew Higgins and his landing craft or Henry Kaiser's prefabricated yards, Nelson represented the self-taught inventor whose intuition outpaced bureaucracy. In each case, rejection by authority became the spark of transformation. By the final year of the war, the United States had built 2,010 Liberty ships, 31 Victory ships, and thousands of escort vessels. Everyone bore components fastened by Nelson's process. Small circular welds dotting bulkheads like a constellation of persistence. Behind the statistics was the same lesson. Progress often begins when someone refuses to accept that good enough is good enough. Today, the Nelson Stud Welding Company continues as part of a global industrial group. Its founder's original gun design displayed in technical museums. Few visitors reading the plaque realize that this unassuming tool once helped win the greatest war in history.